Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 254 for Monday, April 27th, 2020. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show that's by, for, and about working musicians, or really just musicians these days, because I don't know how many of us are actually working, but we're working hard. It just might not be the IRS's definition of working, unless you're looking to take a loss this year, in which case it's exactly the <laughs> IRS's definition of working. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. What a technical introduction. Here in San Jose, California. <laughs> Paul Kent. Well, I'm in a technical mindset, man. We've been, you and I have been talking, we have talked and texted about gear more in the last week than we've probably even ever talked about on the show. So, like, it's a technical week, which might as well be. It is kind of fun. I mean, you know, in this time when we don't have gigs to prepare for and, you know, just diving into new skill sets. I know I've gotten back into, you know, some video stuff and definitely have been playing around with these TV studios and a box apps and, and stuff like that. So I'm actually enjoying it and learning a ton and have a bunch of observations I thought would be fun to share. I, I, I'm in, man. You know, all you have to do is like, like hint at the fact that you want to talk about gear and technology and I am in because I've been I am about to, and when I say about to, I mean like within the next 36 hours, rip apart my studio and and go a completely different direction for the podcast and everything else. But we'll Because you can. Well, that's the thing is I can. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we got all kinds of stuff. Hey, can we start with a dissection of that Stones thing? Because you asked me in the last show to, mm. to watch it. Yeah, you kind of peeked back at me right away saying, I know how they did it. I think I know how they I did it. I think I know. Yeah. So, right. So you watch this Stones thing. And for those of you that haven't seen it, it's 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 great. It's I mean, it's it's this organic, messy, perfectly Rolling Stones thing. And Charlie Watts is the freaking star of this because I think I saw a meme on uh, on Twitter or something that says you might think you're cool, but you're not nearly as cool as Charlie Watts playing air drums in his living room. And and that is the key to this whole thing here. So it's it's, you know, effectively, I think it really was like a Zoom meeting or something that they did. And, and it started with Mick and they played. Uh, you can't always get what you want. All right. Uh, but it started with Mick with an acoustic guitar singing. And then you hear then then Keith's camera lights up and you hear Keith and then Ronnie and then Charlie comes in with the drums. But when Charlie comes in with the drums, as I said before, he ain't playing drums. You hear drums, but he's just like got sticks and some boxes and his couch around him. And he's a freaking rock star with it, but he's not actually playing. And that to me was the key. So I went back and watched it a couple of times. You're right. When you said last week they were out of sync a little bit with each other. Um, I think what was happening was Mick, they, Mick was playing. They all were playing to a pre-recorded track of Charlie's drums with a click in it because uh, Mick had to start before Charlie's drums came in. And you can see Mick kind of paying it. You know, he's doing his normal thing. He's a pro. He's vamping and he's like, all right, ready? Here we go. And then there's like a pause and then he comes in with his guitar and, and the tempo never changes. It's like, aha. OK, got it. So he's playing along with this click that eventually then becomes the sound of Charlie's drums that we can hear. And everybody is hearing that. And Keith and Ron are trying to decide, do they play along with the click of Charlie's drums that they hear? Or do they play with Mick? Because sometimes the two are in sync and sometimes the two aren't, depending on how Zoom is getting the data to everybody. But that's where the, the, the one track that was keeping them all in sync was Charlie's drums were being sent out. Uh, yeah, I think that um, Ronnie and, and, uh, and Keith, they're playing live. Mm -hmm. Because they're not quite on. You Absolutely. can tell. And sometimes they're yeah. sometimes they're worse not quite on and sometimes they're closer than not quite on. Correct. But but in order for them, if 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 they were doing it where Charlie was actually, say, playing his drums or all four of them were doing it, it would be a, a nightmare because Charlie right. would be hearing them later than he played the drum part. And that means they would be hearing like everybody would start falling back and back and it would just be a mess. Right. 
But yeah. by by normalizing everybody to the drum to this pre-recorded drum track, uh, it it allowed it to be close ish. I mean, when they tried to sing harmonies with each other, it was like, aha, now I hear how far off everything is. But, you know, Keith and, and Ronnie, but more Keith these days, I never really in time anyway. So to hear them kind of floating their guitar parts in and around things wasn't so bad. Mick's guitar was always locked in with Charlie's drums because that was the source. Right. Yeah. So so you have you have, you know, the two rhythm players locked in there was no bass so you didn't have to worry about that and then having the guitars kind of sort of floating around and being ahead or behind the beat like that's kind of that's the rolling stones i mean that's their magic right there it just we had technology sort of enforcing it this time <laughs> <laughs> so i thought it was the thing cool. about that is that it, it was really cool and it was cool that the rolling stones would do this yes. knowing the technical you know, challenge, you know, and they said, this is good enough for us to do it. We want to put something out there. And I, and I think, again, if you go up to 10,000 feet, that's what's going on right now is yep. that, you know, as everybody is, is in shelter in place and artists, a are going crazy because they need to perform something. B they want to help people. Right. Um, you know, so that even at the level and so many of these big stars, I mean, again, and what we're seeing is, varying degrees of production right so the the thing that Grohl did on that one tv show was just him like like so many other people neil diamond sitting in front of his fireplace the stones take it one level further you know because the whole issue of the band there's a lot of things coming out dave that that uh, are are different hacks of getting people playing together though i mean there's well, this is what we've been saying stuff. is it's gonna evolve and it's gonna evolve initially it's going to be the evolution is going to be rapid, right? It will start to taper off as, as you know, people try these experiments and it's like, okay, well, what did the stones do? Okay. Well that was cool, but not really workable for everything. And like it only works for some stones tunes, even not like you couldn't do Brown sugar that way. Right. It right. worked great. You need a lot of air and a lot yeah, of space. Exactly. Right. You know, so they could have done Angie, but you know, they chose can't always get what you want. Cause that's probably a little better to, you know, <laughs> because they're for the time for the times. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you're not doing honky tonk woman that way. You know, it's gotta be that sort of one person needs to be able to drive is really what it, mm. what it comes down to um and they they hacked it though they made it so that two people could be driving together just not simultaneously and right and so they time shifted part but not all right which is which is an interesting sort of paradigm like you said if you zoom out to ten thousand feet it's like oh that's interesting like okay so we have some foundational tracks that we all sort of agree upon and then we can layer things and uh, you know but net 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 we're you know we're kind of marveling at a at a, at a clever hack about this stuff you know, yeah we're talking about we're talking about music and we're talking about right you know from wrong um i don't know no, enough about the stuff you do i my understanding is true latency free internet connections are going to, that's just a bad physics problem. That can never happen. I don't know. Does 5G affect that at all? Well, I mean, it, it's not, maybe is the answer um, because 5G does cut down on the latency when you compare it to other wireless standards, but compared to an ethernet cable, no, 5G doesn't solve that. Right. You know, that's, that's as good mm -hmm. as, the right. Ethernet's as good as it's going to get because you'll get less than a millisecond latency, typically Ethernet, if you plug into your router. But that's just between you and your router. Like the, the latency introduced by Ethernet is as close to zero as we're going to get. But then the but problem there's many is, hops and paths that, that your signal goes between point A and point B. Correct. Between you and me right now, we're used to it. But when, you know, there are times when we fight over each other, you know, when we speak over each other, I don't mean fight, but when we speak over each other and it's not that we're both speaking at the same time, it's that we're hearing each other on, you know, we probably have a, I, I can't see it right now because we're using a different tech than we usually do, but it's usually about a 50 to 60 millisecond uh, lag between us. I mean, we're across the country. That's even that is remarkable from a technology standpoint that it's yeah, these feel like very natural conversations. And, yeah. you know, again, we're right now we're actually going, we're both going through a, a, a web service to talk to each other. So that's even different than when we're going through the app service where each on our side have an app that's kind of managing the relationship. But now we're going right. through. Yeah. We've a got very, a third party. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, 
Yeah, it's um. It, so, but anyway, I mean, we're you know we're used to it enough that it works. But but yes, there there will be that inherent latency of the multiple hops of quote unquote the internet right between us. Yeah, and and then. But in addition to that, there's the latency that our computers add to the mix, right? If I'm getting audio in, my computer has to convert that from digital to analog. Then it needs to run it through whatever processing my computer might have to do. And then it plays it for me. And then I would re react to that. And now my computer has to do whatever processing it's going to do, convert it from analog to digital. Now send it back across the wire to use. So if there's 50 milliseconds between us, there's 100 milliseconds just baked into the Internet and then any additional time. So, you know, you're it, it, it's not rare to think that you're in triple digits for mill, for, uh, you know, 100 to 150 millisecond delay. And even if you get it all like we could we can work it out and get it much lower. We could get it down to maybe 50 or 60. Right. For the true turnaround, if we really focused and routed things the right way and got really geeky about it. But even that you'll like it's too much. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's you know, you need you'd need it to be in that 20 to. 40. I wonder what the math is on that, it, it, what the math is on that, that it would naturally put certain things in different parts of the beat. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Depends on the tempo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, we could do the math. I mean, right. Well, you know, 60 beats, 60 BPM is one beat per second, right? I mean, that's because mm -hmm. 60 beats per minute. That's how we divide it up. We call that a second. So, um, so you do the math from there. 100 milliseconds. Well, that's one tenth of a second. So you start doing some math and, you know, you get out the cocktail napkin and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> but don't rush. Don't slow down. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> and the math doesn't work. Then the math doesn't work. There are like there's software out there that people are doing exactly that where you're actually setting the tempo and then it will like calculate the lag and then add more lag to get it so that you're all at least sharing the same beat, even though you're not on the, it's weird, but it gets weird. I don't know. There's that jam link thing. I keep coming back to that. The, um, the thing that Dan Meblin mentioned last year when yeah. he was on the show that he said that that worked. Um, that's just a box. So it takes your computer out of the mix. It's all, you know, hard coded into there. It's made as efficient as possible. And he said that worked. Um, but he also was like, I, I don't, I don't mean to, shine any Ill, Ill will on Dan, but he was like a partner in this business or involved an investor or something. So, you know, I know how that goes. I've done that before. And it's like, you know, confirmation bias makes me think, oh yeah, this thing that I invested in, it worked. Like, so I don't know, like I haven't tested it. He did offer to send it to us and, and tested it. And at the time we were like, why would we need that? Now it's like, dang, I wish yeah. I had sent that. Yep. Sure. So, so I'll, I'll tell you um, to set up this slightly longer conversation about, about the technology that's being used. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, and this is relative to my day job life, right? So for a long time, there have been technologies that let you do quote unquote virtual events, right? Um, and now we're applying some of these technologies to do virtual concerts. And the whole thing about this is virtual events never really took off in the scope and scale that people thought. And my thought as a event producer was that they, they applied technology to solve a part of the problem, but they didn't understand the, the elemental humanness of the problem, right? Like, like you say this very well, you say human beings have an innate desire to be with each other, to connect, to do those types of things. Sure. It is, it is different online. And I will say I, I, I've watched in the during the shelter in place, um, all my friends are going at a really great pace of upping their game. They're upping their game in terms of using the TV studio and a box software so, you know, they can get. They sure. can get a lower third scrolling across saying, please tip me. They can, you know, they, they look great. They can use two cameras if they want. They can bring in someone from another place if they want. There's good technology things going on that people are getting their hands around fairly fast. Um, but I, my premise here, very similar to the day job problems that I was thinking about was about, well, what makes these performances compelling? You know, like right now, everybody gets, gets a, benefit of the doubt, including the Rolling Stones. It's more the novel 
heartwarming feeling of knowing the Rolling Stones are trying to make something together than the critical dissection yes. of the quality of the music. Yeah, everybody get everybody gets a, a, a mulligan, a, a Benny, right? Yeah. Everybody gets a, just doing it is is better than not doing it. That's cool. But, but that you know, my premise, that doesn't last. You don't you don't exactly always right. get that. Right. Yeah. That's right. And so I'm going to talk specifically about my, you know, view of this type of stuff, me and a guitar. And this is how we get into the technology part of it. So I've spent a little time learning about lighting. I've spent a little time learning about the, the, the TV studio in a box stuff. Uh, I've thought a little bit about cameras. Um, I've thought a little bit about, um, um, about um, redundancy and, and, you know, what the best connection is. So, you know, I know on my checklist of things that I want to do, I need this connection to go through my computer because my computer can connect uh, via Ethernet into my router. And your computer can do the uh, you can you have more flexibility in terms of what you can do in your computer with mixing and and pulling it all together, too. Yeah. So um, but the one thing that has been weird is there's this wide range of approach to the one guy and one guitar, right? There's there's yep. some people who just want the ambient room. Some people have a slight use of a small PA so they can put some effect on their ambient room. So they're going through a mixer into a small PA and then just a, a pretty much the vocal mic is picking up whatever that, that PA is going. Um, you and I have been talking about this one guy, Tim Bloom, who is using really nice mics and really nice reverb and, and, you know, kind of, but, but because he's using really nice condenser mics, he's essentially singing out into the air and playing out into the air and letting the mics do that work as opposed to it going, you know, hardcore through. Yeah. Well, um, he has the benefit and we'll put a link up. I mean, the, 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 he's done some videos where he sounds freaking amazing. He sounds just like you, he's in a recording studio because it turns out he's in a recording studio, right? You know, (laughs) well, the sound of the room starts to matter as the further the mic gets from you or your instrument, the more the sound of the room is involved in the overall thing. Now, in a nice recording studio, the room is a beautifully sounding instrument. Mm, Our living rooms and our kitchens often are not beautiful sounding instruments. Now, beautiful is subjective, sure, but I definitely don't want to hear your bouncy room mixed in with the audio that I'm playing out of my speakers into my bouncy room, right? So you want to have, you know, you want it to be fairly tight, but there's a there's a there's a little bit of gap there, right? Between super clean, tight, no reverb, no ambient sound, nothing like dry yep. and musical. And again, and this is actually my point, though. Yeah. So so my point is the you know, there, there's there's if money is no object <laughs> and then there's also practicalities of doing this. Right. Yeah. And then there is what is most effective. I know um, for me. Um, I'm paying a pretty good price for having poor mic technique. When I pull off to hit a high note, my volume goes way down. And when I don't think about it, that I want to talk between songs and I'm not right on the mic, yeah. my volume goes way down, right? Yep. Um, so that, I don't have a recording fair, studio in a great room. That happens not to you. You actually do this fine live, but that happens. I've seen that with a lot of, you know, front person uh it could be the lead singer it could be whoever is the front person you can hear them fine when they're singing and then they go to to talk in between songs and it's like hey i want to thank everybody for coming out tonight (laughs) it's like what you gotta project man like that mic isn't gonna do the work for you you gotta do it you know so so my point is that i i could probably find my way to saying i don't need a neumann you 67, a $7,000 mic. I, I do. You know, I do. For, for the, the, one, the one you were going to send to Paul, send it here. We need it. <laughs> but I, I think, um, I think this vibe of these streaming shows are, you want to be able to hear, you want the performer to be casual. That's part of the vibe of them. At least they are right now. Maybe we're going to end up everybody, ha- you know, the, the, the push is going to be for nice backdrops. I mean, when the, we, we talked about a nice guy, um, Clay a couple of weeks ago, Clay Bell. And, you know, he bought for 30 bucks, he bought soundproofing curtains that he hangs behind him. And now there's a beautiful curtain behind him. It looks like a stage. And then he, you know, he uses some simple lighting that, you know, he looks, he looks great. And that those, those uh, streams look really good. Um, but I'm a little stuck on the acoustic guitar part because 
I've been running it through my Bose um, personal audio system and it feels kind of sterile to me from, from an acoustic guitar. I mean, I, I just believe acoustic guitars need to breathe. And, and if we're talking about trying to communicate um, uh, a rich, warm sound, I kind of like what Tim does. I think he has a Telefunken um, mic on his. He's got a, um, a pretty, he has good technique. Yeah, he does have good technique. He's not moving around. And you're right. It's a Telefunken, but it's a small diaphragm condenser, very yeah. directional and not very colorful on those mics. Like a, it, generally, those mics are used to pick up the exact sound of the instrument that you... He's got these gorgeous Martin guitars. It's a great well, exact sound to pick up. Yeah. And then you got to know where to aim it too, right? Like I've always been taught, start at the 12th fret of the guitar and and then, you know, adjust from there. But that's a good place to aim your mic. Don't aim it right at the tone hole. Don't, you know, get... You want some attack. You want some some clarity out of it. So go for the 12th fret and then, you know, and then adjust from there. But if you're going for the 12th fret and the guitar players all over the place, well, you're not at the 12th fret anymore, you know? Yeah. Right. So, so there's a lot involved in that simple instruction, even when that instruction is just a, a starting point anyway. So, and maybe that's, that's actually the most important point is like, I know to me, the more I have to keep an eye on the technology, the more I have to keep an eye on the TV studio and the box stuff, the more I have to keep an eye on the Facebook comments coming in. If I do a Facebook live stream, the more I have to keep an eye on the, the whatever technology is amplifying my music. That's it's a lot of things and makes it pretty hard to disappear into just doing your thing and, and, and giving a performance that has some resonance to it. So it, it's a, it's a moving target for me some of the stuff is getting easier and you know i know exactly what i'm doing and i know i don't have to think about it some of the stuff is still you know a mystery you know and and you know i know the brittleness of my guitar the, the kind of antiseptic nature of taking it out of the mic excuse me out of the pickups that are in the guitar and running it through and i listen back and i'm actually getting quite a few compliments that the sound is really good i think the sound is really clear it is. But, but you know, that's I mean, think about. So let's I want to dissect this a little bit here because it's geek time. Right. So <laughs> it, it, first of all, it, it is worth you don't want to just give up based on this next point, but it is worth considering what people are using to listen to you. Right. Because some folks are going to be using, you know, very nice headphones or maybe they're high quality speakers in their house. But most people are going to be listening on their phone. Uh, you know, and the speakers in those have gotten better over the years, but they're, they're I mean, in the grand scheme of things, phones have crappy speakers, right? Laptops have crappy speakers. Again, they're way better than they were even five years ago. But compared to, you know, a big set of speakers that you'd put on your bookshelf or something like it's there's just no comparison. So you do need to think about like it, whether you are going too far it, because if you've got a lot of nice room noise, that might sound good out of out of big speakers. But in a laptop, it starts getting, you know, very they're, they're They sort of accentuate the mid range. And so now you're getting all this bounciness that's that's more pronounced out of laptop speakers. So you want to be aware of of what it's coming out of. And I highly recommend everybody record your Facebook streams, you know, let it keep them, even if you make them private or whatever. And then go listen to them on everything afterwards, because this is going to inform you as to how to change things for your next show and your next show and your next show. Um, but let's talk about gain structure for a minute, because you're plugging your guitar into your mixer. And then from your mixer, you're going USB into your computer and you're done. And right. the and you're not the sound is fine, but you want it to be better. And so the immediate thought is I need to mic the guitar instead of using the piezo pickups. And you, you may be a hundred percent right about that, but it is worth considering what else is in the mix there because it's not just piezo and computer. It's piezo into the, I'm not going to bring cables into it because I'm not one of those people that thinks that, you know, you're going to make all the difference. Don't have <laughs> crappy cables. If they're, if they're broken and noisy, don't use them, but otherwise it's going to be fine. But you know, piezo pickup into your mixer. Okay. Well, what, What's that mixer doing? Where are you setting the gain on that mixer? Are you saturating it enough? Do you even have the ability to control that on that mixer? Some of those tower speakers, you don't get to set gain. You just set volume. Well, that's not th all that good. You know, getting an audio interface like a, you know, a little two channel focus right thing like that's probably going to have way cleaner inputs and preamps 
than whatever you have in one of those tower things. Because those tower things aren't meant for recording. They're not, they're meant to be used live. And so they often right. are pretty noisy and that's okay. But, uh, you know, and I say pretty noisy, like in the grand scheme of things, you know, compared to what you might get, again, even out of a little, you know, two channel focus, right? Like Scarlet Unit or whatever. You were my post about- out. My Bose Tower thing is awesome live and, right. you know, the sound live and the richness and the way that they kind of, I don't know whether they're, they're tuning the speakers or whether they're tuning the, the, um, I kind of tend to think that it's, it's Bose's approach to speakers more than it is Bose's approach to, um, the mixer. They have a yeah. mixer that has some presets for some things, but when listened after, you know, like you said, taking it right out of the, out of the mixer, it has a certain sterility to it Correct. that isn't translating Right now, right? right. You know, and your mic your preamps, a decent mic preamp will make a huge difference. Um, and then being able to take it and put it into your, you know, your your DAW, and that might be Logic or Reaper or Mainstage. Actually, for Apple users, Mainstage is probably, the, it, it might be the best 30 or 40. I can't remember if it's 30 bucks or 40 bucks. I think it's just 30 bucks. It's like Logic, but built for live performance only, right? Right. So think about what we're doing here. Aha, maybe main stage is the answer, you know, um, if you're an Apple user. But, you know, they're put even running it into any DAW where you can adjust not just your gain, which you would be doing on your audio interface, unless you happen to have an audio interface that that really is tied in with your DAW, like those universal audio things that you're thinking about getting. And I, I want to learn more because um, that what, the Apollo is the one you're looking at, right? Arrow. The Arrow. Sorry. I, I, the Apollo is the next level up on on you, you audio, right? Yeah, I think so. OK, yeah. so and and those are interesting interfaces because they aren't just an interface. They're also a signal processor. It's a tied together a lot tighter with your uh, with your digital workstation, uh, which is very cool. But, it, you know, regardless of what you wind up getting. Now you have the ability in your DAW to do some EQ and some compression and I, I have to wonder if, a, you know, and we home studio people have a tendency to way overdo it on any of the effects and and uh, processes in the single signal chain that I'm, I'm mentioning here. But, you know, the right amount of compression, the right amount of reverb, the right amount of EQ probably will take that guitar through your piezo pickup and make it sound better now. Will you still, even with that, will you still want to use a condenser mic on it? Maybe. I don't know. But you don't. But that's the thing is we don't know until we start to kind of dissect the process here and say, OK, what, where is it that's that's what's the weakest link in the chain? And then you fix that and you're like, yeah, but still I could get, get it better. And then you're like, OK, great. You know, go to the next link, go to the next link, go to the next link. Um, but it is worth and we have time now. Most of us do anyway. So um, it is worth, you know, this is I, I talk about sound here all the time. What we're talking about, what I'm talking about specifically here, sort of breaking it down. This is how I began to learn because I was the drummer. So that meant we rehearsed at my house and all the gear was at my house. And I hated either hearing feedback or nothing from the vocals at band rehearsal. So on days when we didn't have band rehearsal, I would go downstairs to the basement and start messing with this stuff and be like, okay, how does this EQ? And this was back in the days when everything was separate. You know, you, you, you were lucky if you had an EQ to use on your PA and somebody had one. And so we had that and I was like, oh, how's that work? And I was like, wait, what's this gain knob do? Oh, okay. I see. So I set the gain first, then bring the level up. Now it's not distorting, but I have a punchy signal. Amazing. Like, I, you know, that that day was re- a remarkable day for me. And it's it's very basic, but it's worth learning all of this stuff. And I will tell you everything that you're going to learn here about, you know, gain structure, EQ, reverb, compression, all of that stuff will translate live. You will naturally be in a, a headspace to get even better sound out of your instrument or your PA or both when you, you know, when we can all finally go back and do that again. So uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, the tools that are, my hands are on, whether it's putting together videos, I just did a project where um, I, there's a guy who's in town. I don't know him very well, but I really like his band and I really like, you know, the vibe that he puts out. So I just reached out and said, Hey, you want to do a project together? He goes, sure. So I recorded, my half of the Beatles, two of us, 
Nice. I sent, I sent it to him and said, sing right over it. Mm-hmm. And so he just used my part as a monitor. And then he, um, he added his part, sent it back to me, um, open it up, put it in final, uh, excuse me, in iMovie. iMovie does side by side. Yeah. Pretty much pre baked for you and matched up the, the you know, the timelines and, and, uh, and away we go. And we had some added a couple titles. Good. But I haven't used iMovie in years. And so, you know, getting back to that. Was yeah, you get cool. back into it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. But I like it. Yeah. The audio stuff is a little daunting <laughs> and you know, not for nothing. As I'm starting to do some reading on condenser mics, because there's such a wide range in pricing. I mean, literally is a seven, eight thousand dollar condenser mic seven or eight times better than a one thousand dollar, you know, large large diaphragm condenser mic. I mean, it is numbing how many are out there and the wide range in prices. I mean, it's incredible. Well, Worst that's it, art. right, is is the, the wide, wide, wide range of prices. <laughs> I, I, you know, so we, we, as I mentioned, Paul and I have been going back and forth talking about different microphones and, uh, you know, does it make sense to get a large diaphragm condenser? For, f- quite frankly, for most of us, using a large diaphragm condenser for streaming would be a, a a disastrous process because you'd be picking up so much of the ambient sound of your room that unless you already have that reined in, I mean, it's worth if you have it, it's certainly worth trying. You know, every experiment's good to go spend ten grand to, for the experiment. Well, you know, maybe not. But well, I remember when we first started doing this, and you know, I hooked up my, my the only mic I had in the room, which was a blue condenser microphone, yeah. and you, you were like, "Yeah, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna work." Yeah, yeah. Now, if you were in a dead room, it might have worked better. Like, I, I'm still for podcasting. I'm still a big fan of dynamic mics, and we're both using dynamics here. What are you? What's that? What are you using right now? Uh, these days, I'm using a Heil PR40 for um, for my podcast. It it's a it's a great mic. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Heil mics. I um, I've I've used them. I use them live. They they work really well for my voice. I think you feel free to tell me, folks, if if you think I'm wrong. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But um, it, the my only complaint about the PR40 is it requires a crap ton of gain to get it up to the point where you can actually do something with the signal and, and not every mixer has enough gain to get you there without, you know, without hitting like it's top end and where it starts to get sort of distorted and stuff. So, um, but, and, and you're using, if memory serves an audio technica, AT 2005 USB. Does that sound right? That's right. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I will tell you for 70 bucks, that mic is outstanding. It's both USB and XLR, so you can use it either way. When you're using it USB, it's its own audio interface in both directions, so you can monitor out from it. Um, it comes with like a little stand and a cable and a case and stuff for 70 bucks. And when I travel, that's the mic I use. And I have had people many times, you know, when I travel, especially with the other podcast, with Mac Geek, which has more listeners, I will always have somebody that chimes in and says, you know, you sound better when you travel uh, than you do in your studio. And of course, I have some hand gestures that immediately come to mind when somebody <laughs> says that because I have a lot of gear that I spent a lot of money on in my studio, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. It's a good microphone. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as we were looking at all these mics, I it, it had been a while since I dug into, um, you know, the the uh, large diaphragm condensers. And of course, you know, what we started talking about was the the Telefunken 251, uh, which is, you know, one of the gold standard. You mentioned another one earlier, the the Neumann U67. Like these are I think the Neumann U67 is a seven thousand dollar microphone. The Telefunken is a ten thousand dollar. These are tube uh, based uh, large diaphragm condensers. They are the mics that are used in every studio. They add color and warmth to the sound. They give you that rich low end with the sparkly high end. They do pick up a lot of your room too. So you need to be in the right kind of room to record, but for vocals and even I've, I've had Telefunken, I've had these used on as overheads on drums sometimes to really kind of color, but they definitely are an instrument, right? Like they add their own sparkle to the sound, but they're super expensive. So I started digging and I found this company, Paul, called Warm Audio, and Mm. they make replicas of these, you know, vintage, revered microphones. Uh, And they their 251 is 
you know, a recreation of the, the Telefunken 251, which retails for about 10 grand. And it has the external power supply, just like the Telefunken does with the tube and everything. And it's, it, they say the MSRP is $799. I think Sweetwater sells it for $699. Now, that's still a lot of money to spend on a microphone. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's less than 10% of what you would spend on the thing that it's cloning. And I listened to some A-B tests because people have done them. And you can hear a little bit of difference. I can hear a little bit of difference between the two. Like I closed my eyes. $10,000 worth of difference. But no, not even close. I Like I could just take the the EQ and, and give the low end like a little bit of a rise. And I feel like for my home studio stuff, I would be ecstatic to have this warm audio mic. Like ecstatic. Mm. So... I, you know, it's an interesting thing that I've been like, oh, okay. And, and you mentioned the Neumann, uh, the, the U67, right? Well, warm audio makes, I think their own 67 mic. I think I saw it somewhere. I'm lying now. Cause I'm looking on their website and I don't see it anymore. Um, but I swear I saw it somewhere. I'm, okay, well, maybe I'm going crazy, but they do, they make their own version of uh, the uh, 414 microphone. It's the WA14. Okay, it's not an AKG, but it's, you know, it's it like it does the same thing. And it's interesting. Uh, oh, they have their their 47, not the 67. They, they have the, the clone of the Neumann uh, 40, U, um, U47. Yeah, so... Um, so it's just it's you know, but these things are inexpensively priced and well, they, rel- relatively. That's that's the thing. Relatively, Relative. yeah. There's still and that's like, still a guitar. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's still a snake. You know, I have a good friend, a great bass player in this area, who owns a, a local recording studio, Chris Beveridge. Yeah. And Chris, um, I was I, I'm out gathering data now, and I said, well, you know, what are the U67 replacements or clones or you know alternatives? And he said. You know, depending on what price point you want, if you want under 300, Rhodey has the NT2, which he thinks is a great mic at a great Rode. value for 300. Road. Road is um, how you pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, which is like a $300 mic. Yep. And then another boutique microphone shop is Mojave Microphones, has an MA2000 that he would use in those types of applications. I would love it. You know, we ask for feedback all the time. I'm literally in, in data gathering mode now about condenser mics. And so if our listeners, I guess microphones in general, not just not just larger, small diaphragm condenser mics, but if you guys can share, you know, what you're using for not only, well, you know, for live, certainly, but um, I'm, you know, if I'm going to make a big investment in a, in a microphone, I, I'm interested in hearing what other people have had good experiences with yeah. to add to the mix. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would caution all of us. I, like, I, you know, I mentioned that I'm interested in a, in, you know, this, this warm audio thing piqued my interest. It's for the recording stuff that we're doing with, with like fling and bitter pill and stuff like that. Now I would never use it for podcasting, I certainly wouldn't use it for live streaming like in the right room. It's a great mic, but I would not I would not advise people to start with like go get a condenser for your live stream. It might work great. Like Again, it's all, you know, sound is. Well, sound. I, I got to figure out this proximity thing. So there's two parts to this. So one is the very technical aspect. Right. So I pull away for big notes or notes I'm not sure of, to be quite uh-huh. frankly, right? And we all do that. So, <laughs> you, right. You're just, your body says, don't, don't drop don't, your pants. So don't commit. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so from a proximity um, perspective, the condenser mic seem to offer something, but, and I get beat up on this a lot, but I'm going to tell you, I, we always say, don't always be performing here, right? Sure. Here's the deal. Um, I'm going to remind everybody, if you're going to do a streaming performance, it is a visual medium. And I'm definitely finding that um, the ability to not have a mic in your face half covered by a mic and a mic stand covering your, you know, your body. Um, and especially if off your mic stand, if you have any other things, you know, iPad holders or that type of stuff. I don't know if that's the most um, if that's the most agreeable or, or beneficial angle to take. So. If these streaming performances are supposed to be, hey, welcome to my living room. I'm just going to sing out and you're just going to enjoy it. Um, you might consider whether there's there's advantages to technology, uh, sound amplification, sound reinforcement that lets you be a little bit more natural in your performance. 
again, I I've gotten beaten up by other musicians and, and sound people saying, Nope, it's got to go through a mixer and it's got to be, you know, the best quality that you can. Um, I think, I think if I mic my acoustic guitar, that's really the same as it going through a mixer. It's going through a mixer, but it's um, right. Yeah. You're right. But, um, you know, f- there is a, a sweet spot of aesthetic and sound quality that, that may be, and again, I don't know how to how to measure what you're sharing. That that uh, the large diaphragm mics picking up so much of the room make it impractical for a lot of applications like this. But Bloom sounds pretty freaking great. But again, that's a seven thousand dollar mic going through probably Universal Audio preamps, and you know, I think he says he used in the a recording room. studio in a recording studio. Right? Don't I don't know how to measure. Room. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, every, please, guys, uh, if you're listening to this, if you have an opinion on all this, please share it and uh, and help me get up to speed because I want to keep up in my game on this. Cool. I, I I mentioned I got some new gear today that I literally it arrived as I was walking up the stairs to the studio here. So my podcast setup is a hybrid of analog outboard and digital inboard. I'll call it uh, gear, for lack of a better term. And and, you know, my microphone is obviously a piece of analog gear. The cable is analog. It plugs into an audio interface. And then like your audio, Paul, I capture from whatever source we're using as our VoIP call. And believe it or not, I route that out of my computer and I route everything into a mixer. And the reason I do that is because while we're talking, if you are a little quieter, uh, I can just reach over, grab a fader and goose your level. I don't have to if I was doing it digitally, you know, I, I, you know, would have to dig through a couple of windows and find that virtual fader. And I don't want to have to do that. Right. So when I set this up 15 years ago, this is essentially I mean, it's different hardware than it was 15 years ago. But the setup is basically the same. I've got this external mixer. And I can adjust things. Our theme music, like at the end, when I want to fade it in, I'm literally doing that by riding a fader up. If, uh, you know, if Paul starts messing with his mic while I'm talking, I bring it down to about half until he's done. And then I bring it back up. All of that stuff. All right here. If I need to adjust an EQ on a guest or something, it's all right there uh, on a channel strip on this external mixer. Uh, Then. I route that back into the computer where it gets processed a little bit with some uh, compression, a little bit of reverb, just a touch. But it's it's a trick that makes it sound like we're maybe in the same room, Paul. Uh, And then and then, of course, the computer records it and it works out fine, but it's very convoluted. It's convoluted to explain, let alone think about, you know, not only how I have to route things with physical cables, but also in the computer, I'm routing audio six ways from Sunday. So I started thinking about this, Paul, because, you know, we have some time and I thought, well, why couldn't I do this inside the computer? I, because as soon as I do that, if I were to use the computer as the mixer, say I were to use logic or main stage, some sort of, you know, DAW, digital workstation. That all opens up all kinds of things, because now instead of me thinking, gosh, should I get a different compressor? Uh, you know, if I buy a new compressor, like that's it. It's an it's a piece of outboard gear, and I'm and I'm now I'm pretty much stuck that that's the new compressor I'm going to be using. Like, well, if I want to try a new compressor plug in with Logic, I just wire it in and try it. Mm-hmm. And if I don't like it, I try a different one. Mm-hmm. And so I built this setup in Logic, and I recorded a show. I was on a show with a friend, uh, somebody else's podcast last week, and I thought, well, this is perfect. Like. No one needs to know. So I did it in this thing that I did entirely. In, I, I say entirely inside the computer. Obviously, the microphone's still outside, but the, you know, for this setup, the mic's just plugged into an interface. It captures it into the computer, and then a hundred percent of everything is done in the computer. It's still a little crazy to wire it all up that way, but it worked great. And I hear myself on a slight. We were talking about latency before. I've gotten used to hearing myself on probably a 35 millisecond delay because of all the things that I have this running through with logic. It almost sounded too instant. Like I was like, ah, how can I add a little more delay to this to make it sound normal to me? Uh, Which is a good thing, right? So the piece of gear that I got, the one thing that this doing it in, in logic or main stage doesn't solve, is a problem for me. That was weird that I had a weird little audio hiccup. Are you mm-hmm. still with me, Paul? 
I am. I heard you go away for a second. Yeah, that's interesting. We all heard me go away. So maybe this is my mixer fighting me saying, oh, this is if this is the last time you're going to use me, I'm going to make you pay Um, (laughs) because I'm about to talk about what's going to replace it because I don't want to have to dig through windows to find my, um, you know, to find my 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 faders or anything. And yes, I could use my phone as a remote control for logic or an iPad as a remote control. But I've I've and I've tried that. It It's fine. I do it when I travel, but it's not the same as being able to grab a physical fader. But they make, you know, external control surfaces for exactly this reason. So I have a PreSonus fader port eight sitting in a box just close enough to me to read the title on it, but far enough away that it's not tempting me to open it while I'm sitting here podcasting, which is a good thing. Uh, And, and it's a, you know, it's just a USB interface. It has motorized faders. So if I change something in logic, it's presumably the, the mix, the, 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 you know, the control surface will change along with it. And if that, Works and I've got a I've got some uh, from Korg coming to test. I've got a bunch of these things coming to test to find out the best one to use for my setup here. But I'll 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 report back for sure. But you folks will not only hear me talk about the results, but coming soon you will actually hear the results. And hopefully it sounds as good, if not better. If it doesn't, then we go back to the old way. But yeah, yeah, it's something, and it makes it a whole lot more portable because right now I, you talked about points of failure before, Paul. I mean, I've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven external devices that I can see, probably more, plus the computer. And, you know, if my compressor decides to flake out or the power supply in my compressor starts to flake out, well, then I have a problem or whatever the heck just happened a couple of minutes ago. I I don't even know what that was. So, yeah, it's fun. Keeps us keeps me on my toes. So good. Sounds cool. I know. It's fun. It's I will. All right. Last thing for you. Yeah. All right. Um, I need you to right now, you have a browser you can get to. I do. Yeah. All right. I want you right now to bring up this new released Rolling Stone song, living in a ghost town. Okay. A- am, I gonna play a and, am I going to try and play this, uh, in my, uh, in the show here? I can, Ooh. if, can you patch that in? Uh, I, you know, maybe. Uh, let's see. Run, <laughs> running applications, Safari. Turn that on. Okay, I heard things click and crack, so maybe, maybe. Let's bring the fader up. Oh, of course, there's a there's an ad for somebody that's not sponsoring the show, so we won't say who it was. Okay, cool. Now here we go. Okay, dude. Those drums sound freaking. It's like it's like everything that's awesome about Charlie, and like. 10 more years of technology to bring out the life of those drums. It sounds incredible to me. That's, that's to me what drums should sound like. Yeah, man. Yeah, that sounds good. You hear it? it sparkles. Did. Yeah, it sparkles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll put a link to uh, to this YouTube video, Living in Ghost Town. Huh. I had not heard that yet. I had that on my list. Actually, I, I keep a... Anyway, I had it on my list. It would have come up to listen to um, in the office, but... Uh, yeah, living in a ghost town. Cool. Cool. I like it. We'll have to, uh, yeah, I'll have to listen to that jump down. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, yeah. 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 It's good. That's good. All right, bro. All right, man. Well, yeah. The, um, the trick to all this is you said it before, though, disappearing into the, uh, into your art, whatever that art is, right? Into your performance. And, and too much of this technology makes it difficult to disappear into it. I, I've, I've become so much more aware of that lately. We haven't done, I haven't done any live music streams, although we will be doing our album release party with parties with bitter pills starting on Saturday. Um, We're going to do, we decided instead of doing the whole album at once, we're going to do two or three songs uh, once a week for th- at least three weeks. So Saturday, Saturday and Saturday, starting this Saturday, whatever this Saturday is, May 2nd, right? Second. Yeah. May 2nd. And because I'm in a band with a bunch of stoners, we're doing it at 420 PM. <laughs> so that's, okay. that's, that's what time I was told to be there and I got to set up the stream. So, uh, but we're going to go through a couple of tunes and play them and then, you know, talk about them and, and that sort of thing. So that'll be fun. But, uh, you know, my Mac Geek Gab podcast, as I mentioned, we've been doing video. We've been, you know, streaming us while we're while we're doing the show. 
And and I think we should do that here, Paul, now that I've kind of got a, a workflow down. But that's exactly what I'm talking about is it has been for the last three weeks. I have I'm just starting to feel settled. You're going to have to put pants on. What's I, well, that, there's that. Yeah. I have to remind my co-host to put pants on, too. <laughs> um, yep. But uh, uh, yep. True story. Uh, but, it, you know, it's distracting having this extra thing that I've got to manage while the point is to be, you know, performing. I mean, that that show like this show is a performance. We're trying to deliver something that's entertaining and engaging and all that. And if if either one of us is distracted by something that pulls us off our game. And, and it's exactly what you were talking about with your live stream. You know, when you've got the comments and the this and the that to manage and is everything working and all that. It's like, well, isn't the point just to play for people? I'll just leave, I'll leave you with this because yeah. last Thursday, the stream that I did. So on your recommendation, I went and downloaded this absolutely marvelous piece of software called Mimo Live, which is one of these TV studio in a box. Yep. We've talked about OBS, which is kind of the free open source one. This is not free, but it's really reasonably priced. And yeah. I got it and I, I made enough headway with it on Monday to think that I could probably be good enough with it by Thursday to get it done. And it clicked all the boxes for me. I could connect my phone right, tethered to it so I can use the height and not have to go out and buy a better quality um, uh, a video camera um, because the one in my MacBook Air is, there, is 15 frames per second. So I could use my phone, that good quality video. I could go out of my computer, direct in via Ethernet and make sure that the that it is the best connection I can have, um, you know, for streaming it upstream. So it, it, it clicked all these boxes, right? And um, I spent time with it. Felt I was pretty good. Then my, my streams are Thursday night. Then by Wednesday afternoon, I had a couple of problems that I couldn't figure out. And I was getting uh -oh. pretty stressed about it. Thursday morning, you know, I, I'm back in the saddle and I think I'm getting there. And, you know, all through the day, I'm testing, I'm testing, I'm testing. What's the one thing I forgot to really... Two things I forgot. One, I forgot to click the switch that doesn't mirror image my, uh, me. So it looks like course. I was playing left. Yeah. Which bothered the heck. And the, and the way that that goes... Switch. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that that goes is I start to play. People are you know coming into the virtual room saying, oh, it sounds great. And then all of a sudden someone says, hey, something's wrong, whatever that might be. In this case, it was you're backwards. That's in your mind now. Right. And you're like, because you go through this process, should I stop, get up, you know, figure it out? Should I just push through? And, and now you're not focused on the music you're playing, right? The other thing that I did was I thought that the, and there was no way to test this at the time, or well, there was, but I didn't think of it. Um, I put my phone in airplane mode, but not in do not disturb mode. So the alerts that I were coming that. in as people were texting <laughs> me were showing up on the screen, but they weren't showing up on the screen that I was looking at it. So I didn't know until we started it. And so, you know, again, the little things, and again, we're certainly people are so nice and, you know, there is a, there's a, a, a an area of forgiveness now, you know, that just, just right. someone offering me this free entertainment is, you know, pretty cool, but you know, I want it to be right and I want it to be good. Yeah. So the little things that come up and it takes a while and uh, you know, you can take advantage of the, of the goodwill of people now. And, you know, it's not life or death if you're playing left-handed. No, but it does stuff. matter. Like in the well, grand, it your head. It, well, and, and in the grand scheme it affects your performance you know this mac geek cab thing i've i've been in the same boat but i've already gotten audience like the most important currently the largest audience i don't want to say that anybody's more important than the others but you know sheer numbers sort of speaks is our audio audience right we've only been doing the video for a little while that it's you know it's one percent of the audience is now watching the video versus listening to the audio and but having all of that going on has pulled me off my game a little bit, as I was saying. Mm. And I never had to worry. I would come to the studio. I'd wake up on Sunday morning. The show, like the agenda and all of that stuff is something I would have prepped earlier in the week. I wake up Sunday morning. I come over here. I turn things on and we roll and we, you know, knock it out of the park every single time. And then we started doing video. And the park got a little bigger, you know, and the bat got smaller and the ball started coming in way faster. And I realized, you know, I'd be halfway through the show and it's like, oh, I didn't like set the the panning right. Oh, crap. OK, I never forgot about that before. And then it's like, oh, I didn't turn on my light here. And I have a panel light to make me look a little better in the studio. I didn't turn that on. Oh, I didn't check John's audio level on the stream. 
And none of these things did I think about before because it was just automatic part of my workflow. Each of them was sort of added in a very gradual way and it became a natural thing. So now I have a, a pre-flight checklist and I go through the whole thing. And thus far, every week, that checklist has saved my bacon. It's not like, you know, I, I hope to get to the point where I read through the checklist and it's like, yeah, that's already done. You know, but uh, but at this point, it ain't. And and it's a good little litmus test for me to be like, OK, you got to be on your game, you know, get, yep. get a good night's sleep, wake up, you know, don't wake up 10 minutes before the show, wake up an hour and a half before eat, chill, breathe, you know, get the blood flowing, like be on your game. Um, so, you know, but it's fun. I like it. It keeps me engaged. This is a little too much for me right now, but it'll it'll settle in. I'm I'm confident that it's not it's not too much of a stretch, but it is a lot. So we'll see. We'll see how I do when I add this whole logic fader thing. I'm hoping that makes it easier, but I'm not, you know, I know myself. There's no way <laughs> I'm going to add Go too much God. complexity. That's it, man. Via con Dios. Via con Dios. That's what we do. That's how it all works. All right. Well, that's what we got for today. If you got anything, though, like Paul said, send it to us. Uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear what mics are you using? What? Uh, you know, what, what, what's your setup looks like? Like, what is your, you, what's your gain structure look like? And when I say gain structure, I just mean like, what's, what's your signal chain and how do you have things set? Like what settings have you found made a difference? What, uh, you know, compression or reverb or anything like that. We'd, we'd love to do it because we're all, I, this is a good thing. So many more people are caring about this stuff. And I really believe that five years from now, we're going to have musicians that are saying, oh, yeah, you know, when, when we were in quarantine, man, I learned a lot about stuff I probably should have learned about 10 years prior, but never spent the time. And now we all have the opportunity to spend the time. I think it's a good thing. Right. So, yeah. Cool. And get a tripod for your camera. This is so many of us, you know, even with a like a webcam or whatever, the temptation is to put it right, you know, just on your on the top of your laptop or top of your monitor or whatever. But your monitor isn't always exactly where you want the camera. A lot of times it's too close to you. So get a tripod and then you can, you know, you get some flexibility there. So yeah. anyway, I don't know. These are all my crazy thoughts that go through my head, Paul. <sighs> well, here we go. So much for that. One always more in be the performing. Can. Oh, yeah. One With more. good audio. That's the idea. You're, you sounded great today, by the way. Speaking of mic technique. My coach. There you go. 